So this evening, we'll hear from each of the 20 2011-2012 Youth Associates who will tell their stories and share their experiences with you. I think it's worth mentioning that all of our presenters tonight returned from their placements overseas less than two weeks ago. They're still processing and making sense of their experiences, and so I congratulate them on being able to take their unique moments and experiences and transfer some of them to you in a few short minutes. As you either already know, or will soon observe, they truly are a remarkable group of young people. I'd now like to introduce and invite the director of Cody International Institute, Dr. John Gaventer, to say a few words. <coughs> since, uh, since taking the helm just over seven months ago, Dr. Gaventer has worked tirelessly to further all aspects of the work of the Cody Institute, and youth programming is certainly no exception. His enthusiasm for the Youth in Partnership program, and for the Youth Associates in particular, has been a great motivator for all of us. And we very much appreciate the generous amount of time and energy that you've given to the program. Dr. Gaventa. Thank you, Adam, and welcome to all of you. All of you. Thank you very much for coming to, to meet and hear from this incredible group of young people. I've had the opportunity to, to learn from them both and to chat with them both before they went and since they've returned from their placements. But before we want to be moved to that, I just want to also acknowledge, and of course, uh, I'm sure this theme will come up throughout the evening, that today is International Women's Day. And this morning, the Cody Institute uh, participated in a large event in Halifax where Dr. Linda Jones, the leader of our Women's Leadership Center, uh, gave a major presentation. Um, some of you might have seen the op-ed piece from her in the Chronicle this morning. Um, there's copies in, in the back that talks a little bit about the, the work of women leaders as well as uh, the youth leaders um, who are here tonight. Last week, um, some of you may know, we, we graduated our first group of global change leaders, or not graduated, they went off to their placements. 16 incredible women uh, from around the world who, like the youth interns, studied here, are now going to different countries for placements and will be coming back. And we held a very successful event in Ottawa as kind of a warm-up to International Women's Day in which some 230 people came to hear the stories of these women. And we heard those stories of women playing the role as change makers in the area of the economy, economic development, um, climate change, resilience, human rights. It was an incredible group of women. So I think it's great also that we are doing this event on International Women's Day um, as well. So welcome to this Youth Forum where you'll have the chance to hear, as Adam said, from our youth interns who have been to Botswana, Ethiopia, Ghana, Peru, Rwanda, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And as Adam said, I think it's a great accomplishment that this is the 15th anniversary of this really unique program. These, I should also point out that these internships would not have been possible without the support of the Canadian International Development Agency of CETA, and we're grateful for their support. And the support recognizes the quality of the Cody Institute um, in pro providing the interns um, this opportunity. For Cody, it's very important, as you know, not only that we bring people from around the globe here to study, but that we also give opportunity for Canadians to learn more about what's happening elsewhere. And that's really what this program is about. It's giving the opportunity for talented young Canadians to experience the lives of other communities and other cultures and then to bring that back home to Canada and to share that knowledge with those of you with the Canadian public and to use that knowledge to shape their own futures and their own careers, whatever they might be. The students who are here tonight have been had quite a journey. I first met them just after I came as director. They arrived the next week. Um, they were here for a few weeks. They've, went, they've gone abroad. Now they've come back, and shortly they'll be moving on to the next steps in their career. While they were here, they had a chance to learn a lot about Cody and the kind of community development approach 
that we support, building on local talents, local assets, local strengths to build leadership for change. But then from here they went and were placed oftentimes in partner organizations, partner organizations who had also sent people from their communities to be here. So they weren't simply being placed in some distant organization that didn't know about Cody, but in many cases, a place which Cody also has a relationship. They've had an opportunity for several months to participate in those organizations, to participate in the life of those communities, and now we're delighted they're coming back to share that knowledge with us. I think they're fired up. They said they're ready. Last night I went with them to, uh, to go bowling. <laughs> Um, and tonight they're ready to, uh, to really share their experience. So we welcome them and thank you for doing that. But I also don't want to end without thanking Adam, who has helped to mentor and support this group throughout their process. And this is Adam's first group since he joined Cody. And of course the great work of Sheila Savage, who has also been working uh, with the youth team at Cody Institute. So welcome, we look forward to your stories. And thanks to the staff who have been responsible for this. Thanks very much, Dr. Gaventa. I'd now like to call upon Dr. Sean Riley, President of Santa Fe University. And I can safely say a lifelong supporter of the Cody Institute, who has always displayed a keen interest in Cody's youth associates and the valuable experiences they gain overseas. Dr. Riley. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to add my voice to the voices of welcome and congratulations. Congratulations to uh, everyone associated with the program, to uh, staff, to Adam, to Sheila, uh, everyone involved in supporting uh, our uh, youth associates. Um, Adam used the word exceptional uh, in his introduction and um, I had the good fortune to uh, meet the associates but also to um, learn a little bit about their biographies before they came and when they were selected. And I have to say if you um, uh, knew of the background, the educational achievements, the volunteer achievements, the uh, global uh, vision of these uh, uh, youth associates, you would have been uh, as impressed as I was watching them uh, come to the Cody and uh, now will be uh, uh, awaiting anxiously the treat of the evening, which is to see their impressions uh, as they return. I also want to add my uh, voice to uh, the congratulations. I was reminded earlier uh, today that this is the 15th group of youth interns, uh, the uh, 200 plus uh, group that Adam referred to. And I think uh, uh, the godmother of the whole project, Mary Coyle, came in uh, just a little bit after she had been acknowledged. So I'm going to ask uh, Mary Coyle if she would take, uh, take a bow. <coughs> Dr. Gaventa referred uh, to the role of the youth internship program within the CODI and to the uh, expansion of our program and the intensification of our efforts in areas uh, such as uh, women's leadership. Uh, the message to the broad community is that uh, the fertile ground that gave uh, birth to the uh, CODI Institute uh, um, now over 50 years ago uh, is, I think, in a more dynamic situation uh, than it may have ever been in the modern era. Uh, we have uh, expanded programming. Uh, we are intensely working to expand the reach of the CODI, to expand its um, engagement with other Canadian organizations working uh, on development. You've heard in other places and times about uh, some of the uh, program innovations. Uh, what I want to say is that it is also a more and more vibrant part of St. Francis Xavier University uh, as a whole. Um, we have the president of the Students' Union with us, Saul Ullman, who is uh, in the development studies area. 
And uh, I think Alwyn represents uh, a phenomenon that more and more students are attracted to the university, are engaged uh, in the issues that are being dealt with uh, through uh, the Cody International Institute, uh, and in fact, captivated by the fact that the Cody is a window on many, many of the uh, pressing issues of global society. And I think we will see those uh, pressing issues of global society reflected in the presentations that are coming forward. So Alwyn, would you on behalf of St. Vic students take a bow? <laughs> So now for the main event. Uh, congratulations, youth associates. We're uh, thrilled to have you back, and we're anxious to see what you have to present. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm sure that you are all, all as eager as I am to hear from our youth associates. This year's associates have taken a novel approach to sharing their experiences, each driven by a particular message they'd like to convey they found commonalities in their experiences and will present collaboratively on different aspects of development practice. As you'll have seen from your programs, you'll hear presentations from our youth associates who lived and worked in eight countries around the world. Despite this geographic dispersal, they encountered several common themes that unite the group members' various experiences. As today is International Women's Day, as Dr. Gaventa mentioned, I'm happy to report that one of these themes is around gender, and how it was experienced and perceived in some of these places. So it's now with great pleasure that I introduce Tara Moyed, who worked with the Botswana Family Welfare Association in Habarone, to provide an introduction to the group as a whole and to each of the themes to be discussed. Tara. Good evening, everyone. Seven months ago, I, along with 19 other youth, embarked on the biggest challenge and adventure of our lives. We worked on three continents in eight countries with 14 organizations. We departed Canada with very different ideas about development and the concept of volunteerism. We returned with even more varying views on these issues. But within that, we all returned changed. Learned individuals, improved persons. And many of us were even able to help bring about positive change within our placements. I'm here to introduce this group tonight that I feel truly privileged to be a part of and to discuss with you the value of volunteering and programs like YIP. During my interview for this placement, I remember saying that I expect to come out as a changed person after this experience, which I was correct on. Working in Botswana has made me a new person, taught me the value of teamwork, sharing of information, teaching, and inspiring. My coworkers showed me that it is of little use for me to sit behind a computer and simply do work for my organization. Instead, a true team member must work with others to achieve long-term and sustainable goals. In my Canadian work experience, I have very little contact with coworkers unless it was during a meeting. Whereas in Botswana, even report writing and updating of the website were group activities. And this transcends beyond the work environment. Almost any activity can be a group activity. It seems sometimes it takes going across the world to learn the value of a simple concept such as teamwork, camaraderie, family, and friendship. All 20 of us were introduced to important approaches and cultural norms, which are important to bring back with us to Canada, but also they helped us better integrate into the wider society within our placements. The next four presenters will describe their experiences of cultural integration in more detail and explain how the process of integration can be helpful on multiple levels during and beyond our placements. In my interview for YIP, I also remember saying that I do not expect to have as much of an impact at my organization as what I'll be able to take away. Here, I believe I was wrong. Many NGOs in today's world struggle with funding challenges. These challenges, however, for the most part, are restricted to lack of paid positions. Donors are less willing to fund personnel to support the projects that are being funded. As a result, grassroots organizations are increasingly relying on local and international volunteers to support their work. International volunteering, in my view, had never been truly beneficial until I was actually able to see the difference that it made at the grassroots level. Whether it's at the local organization Antigonish, or if you have the resources internationally, volunteering is more important for NGOs in today's economy than it's ever been. The key is to find organizations that have the capacity to teach and to utilize you as a resource, which may be easier said than done. But take my word for it, those organizations are out there somewhere. The Cody Institute is a great place to start. For the youth sitting in this room looking to apply for YIP this year, 
um, you're going to be in very good hands. Having said that, there are a variety of challenges that international volunteers will be faced with. And the Group on Innovations and Challenges will discuss some innovative ways to tackle personal, professional challenges in the field. One particular challenge that most Canadians may face when going abroad, and we feel today as International Women's Day is the perfect time to discuss this, is the different gender dynamics that exist in each country. In our various societal and cultural contexts, we discover significant differences in gender norms as well as women's access to services and the decision-making process. Most times, though, these were coupled with innovative local solutions that the third group will discuss with you in more detail. It is in finding these innovative solutions being developed around us, and sometimes through our help, that we realize that development still has a great deal to give. However big or small the solutions, whether they're happening locally or internationally, change is a choice that starts with each individual, with a choice to put your life on hold for just a little while, to learn more than you ever will in a classroom, and maybe give something back to the community you're visiting, and ultimately bringing those lessons back home. As a group discussing community development, we'll tell you more about. It sometimes takes going halfway around the world to understand an idea that started in your own hometown. There is little point in my convincing you of the value of volunteering by speaking about it. I will leave that to the 19 people that are going to tell their personal stories about their experiences. I think their intellect and passion is all of the convincing that you'll need. Thanks very much, Tara. The first group this evening, as Tara mentioned, will now discuss their experiences in becoming global citizens. Chris Atadia worked with the Caribbean Farmers Network in St Vincent. Aaliyah Hack was with the Holy Cross Hospice in Botswana. Matthew McNevin was placed at the Kigali Health Institute in Rwanda. And Madhvia Garwal worked at the Community Research and Environment and Development Initiatives in Kenya. <clears throat> Global citizenship. It means having the ability to empathize and relate to people from different parts of the world to better understand their problems, values, and lifestyles. And I think it's fair to say that we're all striving to become better global citizens every day. And during our internships overseas, I think we've all achieved that goal in some way or another. So good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Atadia, and for the next few minutes, my colleagues and I will be sharing our experiences with you with respect to how we integrated into local cultures, why this was important to us, and how this has inspired us to be better global citizens. So my internship was in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where I worked for the Caribbean Farmers Network. Uh, and they focused on developing sustainable markets and livelihoods for local farmers. Um, um, with working with them, I was fortunate to work with farmers in the field and meet a lot of really amazing people. Uh, although my work was really enriching, what I really took away the most from this experience was uh, getting, getting to make a lot of valuable and lasting relationships and sharing stories with local people. And I don't think this would have been possible if it wasn't for one chance meeting with a man in Barbados. Now this story begins, it, it took place about two months into my internship where I went on a, a workshop a regional workshop in Barbados, and I was, in, I was taking notes, creating a summary report, and um, on one of my nights off, I went for a walk down by the beach, and I was approached by this man, he, he came up to me, and he started talking to me, and I told him where I was from, what I was doing, and that I was a volunteer, and all this good stuff, and as soon as I said I was a volunteer, he, for some reason, started asking me for money, um, and he first, he asked me, buy this bracelet, and I said, no thanks, I'm okay, and then he said, well, give me $10. And I, w I was kind of surprised, especially after we just had this whole conversation how I'm volunteering and I'm on a stipend, and I'm not a tourist. Uh, but he was persistent and he, and he kept, he kept uh, asking me. And I mean, th this, happens, this sort of thing happened all the time, but I, I was a little curious because this is the third or fourth time this has happened. And, uh, so I asked him, why? I told him I'm a volunteer. How come you're still asking me to give you money? And he, he said something to me that, that was really important to me and it, it, it changed my outlook on the rest of my internship. And um, he said something to the extent of, you're volunteering because you have something to stand upon. If you had nothing, you wouldn't be here in the first place. It's a privilege that you're here volunteering. And uh, I was a bit offended at first, but I took that to heart. And so for the next five months, I told myself, I'm going to treat this experience as, as a privilege. And, 
and not a free pass to just avoid avoid people begging for money on the street. And I did. I I started I started uh, looking looking to submerge myself in, in Vincentian culture. I, as you can see, I, I joined a local soccer team. I was the only uh, foreign player to play in the league. Um, I, I also went out for a lot of outings and picnics with my home state family. And I made two really good friendships with people selling fruit on the side of the street. Uh, one of which I actually taught how to play the guitar. Um, but that, that's actually a separate story in itself, but you can come ask me about that later. Um, and so, yeah, I basically, for, for the rest of my internship, I, I tried to get a piece of culture in every day, whether it was having just a simple conversation or doing some kind of activity. And I think this really helped me to better relate to the local people and really better understand their problems and see situations through their eyes as opposed to a Western lens. And I think what I, what I took away was that uh, it, it taught me that how people perceive me back home, especially in terms of volunteering, is not necessarily at all how people would perceive me and for my actions somewhere else. And, and for that, I owe it all to a man selling bracelets in Barbados. Thank you. Cultural integration will be easy. Uh, at least this is what my initial thought was before I, I left for my placement through the Cody Youth in Partnership program that landed me in Haberoni, Botswana. I was taught here before I left that adapting to a new culture would enhance my understanding of the cultural, historical, social, and political context in which I was to be living. And I figured that my fearless spontaneity would be enough to make the cultural integration a piece of cake. But when I first arrived, I was unexpectedly accommodated with a host family. Ma Di Kaladi, my host brother, was a volunteer at the hospice where I was placed, so it would be easy for me to get to work. Perfect, I thought. I agreed to stay with her and her family for a month, after which I would find permanent accommodations. I was excited at the prospect of learning Botswana culture and stepping out of my comfort zone. It was my first opportunity to integrate. However, in the first three days, I managed to do a lot of things wrong. I managed to displace the teenage daughter out of her room and into sharing a bed with her mother. Every teenager's dream. <laughs> the first morning, she entered at 6 a.m. She didn't knock, and she proceeded to ask, are you awake? I couldn't help but think, I am now. But I said, would it be a, go would it be a good idea for me to get up now? She informed me that it was, and that, and that I was to bathe when she was done in the washroom. I wanted to object, and I can't remember if, it, if I felt more unnerved by the order, per se, or by the indication that I needed to take a bath. <laughs> Overnight, I had become a member of the family. I was, a no I was a new daughter, and I was now a sister. I was expected home for dinner, regardless if I had made plans with the other associates, or if I wasn't hungry. In the end, I did figure it was best to leave and live with the other associates. And when I informed my ma about my decision to leave, she replied, no, you are not leaving. <laughs> I explained that I miss my friend, so ma suggested that my friend come live with me there in my room. In Botswana, family is highly regarded. You take care of your immediate family, you take care of your extended family, and you take care of your friends. Ma didn't want to imprison me in her house. She just wanted to make sure that I was happy and that I was well fed and that I was comfortable the way that she understood it to be, just as any mother would. Her daughter, Kat, didn't mean to schedule my bathing time, but knew that bathing in the beginning of the day was the best way to feel refreshed before enduring the heat and the sun. And so it's through this experience that I learned very, very quickly that cultural integration is certainly not as simple um, as saying yes, but that it's understanding why and embodying the practices wholeheartedly. Okay, I'm a little tall for the microphone, so tell me if you can't hear me. Um, my name is Matt. I'm from a place just outside Toronto, 
And for the last six months, I had the opportunity and privilege of working and living in Kigali, Rwanda. And the, the greatest part about Rwandan culture, um, and I think for some, to some extent about East African culture, uh, is the focus and the importance that they put on building strong relationships and on trusting others. Uh, particularly in Rwanda, it was very common for me to see, um, after the genocide, for me to see um, groups of strangers who had come together to make makeshift families because they had lost their loved ones uh, during the war. And that culture of looking out for one another and supporting each other was something that I found extremely inspiring. But in order to fully integrate into that culture, uh, I had some difficulties. Because I think in Canada, and most certainly in Toronto, where I come from, people tend to get a little too caught up in themselves and are too busy to sometimes think about uh, others. <clears throat> so my integration, my integration started at work. And it started quickly with the realization that the relationships that I made at work were just as important as the work that I was actually doing. So right from the get-go, I started showing up early, 15 minutes early, walking around the campus, making sure that I talked to as many people as I could, greeting them, asking them how their families were. Uh, and I think that enabled me to form some very strong friendships at work uh, and also helped me to help me in my work. It helped me, it enabled me to work uh, more efficiently. Uh, the second thing that I had to relearn was how to talk on the telephone. In Canada, I think I spend most of my time sending emails and text messages uh, but those things don't really fly in Rwanda. Um, so I had to learn how to talk on the phone. And when I talk on the phone, I had to make sure that I asked someone how they were before asking them what I needed from them. Um, but those, those are relatively small adjustments. Chatting at work, talking on the phone uh, are relatively small things. My biggest challenge came from learning to trust other people. Um, as a foreigner in a different country, it can be very easy to put up walls against other people. And in Rwanda, I was meeting new people all the time, and I'm a little ashamed to admit that my first reaction was to keep people away. Um, but thankfully, through some very kind strangers who have now become uh, some of my best friends in the country, they taught me that my first reaction should be to let people in. And if you do that, you can build much stronger relationships, and I hope that now that I'm back in Canada, I can use those lessons to strengthen the relationships I already have and to make many more. Thank you very much. With everything I've pursued thus far, professionally and personally, there is one theme that consistently motivates me further into new adventures and that is the curiosity of understanding our world and beyond. Through this, I'm gradually becoming aware of the true nature of humanity and of spirit, and it is thrilling and humbling to see how we're all weaving this colorful tapestry called life with our individual stories, triumphs, and struggles. And that's where we're interconnected. We're all here in the now. And despite our different nationalities, societies and cultural experiences, we share the same sentiments of hope, love, and community. This internship simply reinforced these observations while offering new insights into what it means to be human. And as a result, the responsibility that comes with being a global citizen and having a global family and universal home. I went to Kenya, Western Kenya as a youth associate. Kenya is a country I was born in and lived in for the first 18 years of my life. And I was therefore very surprised at my own pathetic attempts at dealing with culture shock, despite knowing the local dialect, political and socioeconomic situation, and having an overall sense of familiarity in a place I used to call home. Moreover, I thought I understood the frustrations and challenges of people that live there and thus assumed I would be able to empathize with the community I was immersed in and subsequently fit right in. Unfortunately, this was not the case, as I clung to thoughts of freedom and security of another country I'd come to call home for the past 11 years, Canada. Overall, I now understand the problem wasn't the environment or the culture, 
or people at all that triggered sentiments of unease. It was me. Fear of the unknown and the desire to look at life through a particular lens I found comfortable and provided a reference point prevented me from embracing the beauty and opportunities of growth and love with a new family. Despite acknowledging this, I fully admit I still underwent periods of discomfort, which I am now grateful for due to the expon exponential practical experiences they offered in becoming a better person while allowing me to define and highlight how important cultural integration was and is, and how the concept of home is more a feeling as opposed to a physical locality. I believe cultural integration is the ability to truly and wholly engage in and with a community, both as an observer and a participant. As an observer, we are able to acknowledge both similarities and differences each culture and community offers. We often make judgments based on these observations and have a tendency of labeling certain traits and behaviors. And by doing this, we compartmentalize and limit the experiences we have. As a participant, we immerse ourselves into a life that is often foreign to us, yet one that promises nothing less than positive growth and change. We do this within our own capacity, sometimes bravely and sometimes with fear, often needing to take baby steps as we get comfortable in our new environment. As a participant, patience is integral. The importance of integration is heated by the opportunities that arise as a result of embracing a new home and family on a personal, professional, and societal level. And I have only been successful at this when I have consciously dropped all preconceived notions and stereotypes behind with what is known and comfortable, and instead leap into the unknown with an open heart and mind. Additionally, as someone who thrives on seeking knowledge and wisdom the universe has to offer, I've been lucky enough to travel, and in each location, despite the obvious disparities, there was still a family to meet, a community to acknowledge, and a home to feel welcomed into. With this awareness, I feel a heavy sense of responsibility and owe it to myself and all those I come in contact with to live as an engaged citizen advocating for equal rights in the name of humanity while providing and tending to basic human rights of communities in a manner that propels a life full of abundance, joy, and freedom of expression for all. I strongly believe cultural integration creates the space where true development can occur with a passion driven by humility, acceptance, integrity, and a newfound respect for the beautiful diversity offered to us in a world that functions on interdependence. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. The next group of associates will now talk about some of the challenges they had and observed during their placements and the innovative approaches that were taken to overcome them. Alex Wilson was with the Botswana Council of Churches. Farah Jazuli worked at the Kigali Health Institute in Rwanda. Kyle Gillespie was placed with Sustainable Grenadines Incorporated uh, in Grenada. Kathleen Courtney was at SOS Sahel in Ethiopia and Tyson Farrell worked with the Centre for Indigenous Knowledge and Organisational Development in Ghana. I found that my experience in Botswana was not quite the same as my time in other developing countries. I was surprised that I could drink tap water, for example, or flush toilet paper down the toilet. I even went for sushi a few times. And within a few days of arriving, I could see why Botswana is often exemplified as Africa's success story. Interestingly, I came to see Botswana as a land of paradoxes. As a country in Africa relying heavily on the export of natural resources, namely diamonds, Botswana has avoided the fate plaguing mineral-rich countries in the region, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Sierra Leone. Instead of armed conflict and civil war, 
Botswana boasts a long tradition of representative, gov uh, representative democracy, as well as free education all the way to postgraduates, and free health care for all of its nationals. This brings us to another paradox. Botswana, despite its wealth, uh, effective government, and health care resources, has failed in addressing and slowing the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. Countries like Uganda and Zambia, with fewer resources, have had greater success in addressing this health crisis. Botswana currently has the second highest infection rate in the world after Swaziland. And despite a slow response to address this crisis, there is both a demonstrated will and capacity to deal with HIV and AIDS. More and more innovative solutions have been put forward to stop the spread of the virus. One example of innovation in this field is the use of mobile technologies. Through text messages, people living with HIV and AIDS in Botswana can receive reminders on when to take their medication or when to go see the doctor. Information is also accessible through text messages or toll-free numbers. It's safe to say that nearly everyone in Botswana has a cell phone, and so this, service, this free service gives people living with HIV and AIDS access to both information and support. We would like to examine in these presentations how challenges in international development have been dealt with creatively. Farah will now share her, ex uh, her experience of challenge and innovation in Rwanda. everybody. So tonight I'm going to share with you a story about how creativity helped me in my internship. So as Alex said, I completed my internship in Rwanda at the Kigali Health Institute or KHI. And during my time at KHI, I was responsible for teaching anatomy and physiology courses to students preparing for careers in healthcare. So as some of you may know, up to a few years ago, the official language in Rwanda was French, and this meant that my students were educated in the French system. However, a few years ago, English was introduced as the official language, as well as the official language of instruction. But my students didn't necessarily have the strongest English skills. Now, as you can imagine, this made teaching complex scientific concepts to students in English, who were only learning English, a very difficult task. And so I had to come up with alternative and creative methods of teaching, and one solution was to use visual aids and visual methods of learning. And in Canada, we traditionally use things like PowerPoint presentations. And this is feasible in Rwanda, however, it's not necessarily reliable. The tools that we have here in Canada, we sometimes take them for granted. So for example, I didn't always have access to projectors, like we see here, and often we had power outages in Rwanda, which meant that using technology in the classroom was virtually impossible. So one solution that I had was to actually have the students act out physiological process, a physiological process. So one example is when I was teaching about muscle contraction, I would have a student act as a muscle fiber, and then a student act as, an ener as energy, and so on. And in this manner, the students took an active role in learning and actually enjoy this experience more than they would have a traditional lecturing type of teaching. Also, the students really appreciated this style of learning because they got to learn together and they got to help each other. And in Rwanda, we really embrace a sense of community. So in this context, this style of teaching was uh, very suitable and uh, a lot of fun for the students. And this also helped overcome language barriers, since the students weren't stuck listening to me lecture in my Canadian accent all day. They were really happy about that. So <laughs> in summary, um, using creative methods, I was able to overcome obstacles like a deficiency in tools and language barriers and promote participatory learning and fun in the classroom. Thank you. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to, uh, to pose a quick question. Uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? <laughs> My name is Kyle, and uh, <laughs> unlike many of today's speakers, my background is not in development. Um, <laughs> but as you can probably tell in marine science. 
So when I arrived in Karakou, Grenada last August, uh, uh, my, uh, I was ready to work in a newly established marine conservation area. Uh, my tasks, while challenging, seemed relatively straightforward. I'd be working on environmental impact assessments, creating ecological monitoring plans, and assessing the ecological health of the marine protected area. That, however, all changed after about day three, when I got to talking to a local fisherman on one of the island's many white sandy beaches. I mentioned that I was working with the marine protected area, and what started as a very friendly interaction quickly became very tense. The fisherman insisted that the marine protected area was a very bad thing. The fisherman told me that himself, along with his fellow fishermen, uh, were not being consulted in any of the planning process and did not feel like they had a voice. Sure, there might be benefits down the road, but we need to fish. Otherwise, how do we feed our families today, he asked. I didn't have an answer. He and other fishermen did not see the park as being legitimately created, and thus they did not feel they had to abide by the fishing bans. It became clear that no matter what conservation projects the park created, none of them would work in the face of fisher folk resistance. There was no trust between the rule makers and the resource users. So what started as an internship in environmental work quickly turned into an internship in human relations. I felt completely out of my comfort zone. I've never been in a situation where I've had to deal with uh, and compromise with people so much, especially compromising with disgruntled uh, fishermen. Over the coming days, it became increasingly apparent that poaching and destructive fishing practices were rampant in the marine protected area. Fishermen would time their fishing around warden patrols, fishing early in the morning or in the moonlight. But what options did they have? The skyrocketing price of fuel meant that it was too expensive to motor outside the marine protected area to fish. There was a feeling of hopelessness. Fishermen felt no ownership uh, for their fish resources. They were snatching every fish they could get in the little time they could discreetly be out in their boats. They often aimed for rare species for which they could sell for higher prices. There was very much the attitude of, if I don't catch these fish, someone down the beach will catch them. And it showed. Reefs were being decimated, mangrove forests cut down, sea turtles were being caught and eaten. It was becoming glaringly obvious that improper fisher folk engagement was the weakest link in the conservation process. At the park, we needed to engage the fishermen and show them that we were serious about listening to their needs and taking them into account uh, when making conservation plans. The most immediate need uh, was for a non-destructive inco income source for these fishermen. So we got in touch with some experts from around the Caribbean who told us about something called sea moss farming. Sea moss, a type of red algae, is used to produce carrageenan, a product that is now used in many consumer goods. Cosmetics, ice cream, and all sorts of different foods. There's a global demand for it, and it is profitable. Sea moss farming is low impact and grows in warm, protected coastal waters on long lengths of string just the conditions that exist in Karakou's MPA. And so the engage engagement process began. And so as we sit here tonight, the first sea moss trials are underway on Karakou within the MPA. Soon after we opened the communication process with fishermen, uh, they started showing up at park management meetings, engaging in the management process. They recently formed a fisher folk cooperative, where they often speak of the importance of there being fish in the sea for their children to eat. There has been a significant drop in poaching activity in the park, and recently there have been reports of fish numbers bouncing back, with some fishermen saying that they have never seen so many fish, and such big fish, as are now found in the waters around uh, Karakou. It just goes to show how a little engagement and some creative alternative livelihoods can go a long way. Thank you. Um, development is often about bringing good ideas to countries that are dealing with serious issues. My question is, what about the good ideas that we can pull from developing countries to apply to some of the challenges that we face here in Canada? Food security is an issue in Canada and is rampant in countries like Ethiopia, where I've spent the last six months. Here at home, led by cities such as Toronto, is a movement toward more food security and a healthier, more environmentally sound food system. Elements of this movement are founded upon support for uh, things like urban livestock and hen keeping, 
support for more farmers markets around the city that sell local food, and an increase in food outlets in all neighborhoods of every city so that anyone can access food regardless of where they live. Interestingly, innovative ideas like these are actually the stuff of everyday life for many households in developing countries like Ethiopia. Ethiopia's food services are full of local food, one of which that I visited um, served a menu that was made of entirely locally procured items, including flour, spices, produce, meat. Families in urban and rural settings keep livestock, and children grow up learning how to prepare and clean meat at a young age. It's very easy to access food in any neighborhood in Ethiopia's capital, and many practices around food are environmentally sound. Um, such as making baskets and containers out of naturally fallen um, natural resources, or selling produce, such as beans, in recycled paper. In a way, we can say that here in Canada, we are looking up to Ethiopia, where households carry out these practices at home, those of which many of us care about more and more and more, and consider innovative. Ethiopia's and Canada's food cultures are shaped by many factors a complex global economy, international and national policy. It's not always by choice, however, that Ethiopians partake in such traditional ways. Um, a month ago, I was eating lunch with a colleague, and uh, we were discussing how uh, many people in Canada um, are inspired by folks that have the opportunity to raise their own livestock and um, learn where their food comes from, as we say. And uh, his response was, knowing where many of us buy our food in grocery stores, was, are you kidding me? And uh, do you know what I have to do if I want to cook beef for dinner? Um, so I first said, let's finish our lunch, and then we'll talk about it. Um, but uh, so considering that it's not always a, a first choice for some people, um, I do believe that Ethiopia's food-related traditions are inspiring. And as the country develops, it is likely that households will be exposed to more options as far as um, accessing food and using food and food products. Um, it's my hope, however, as the country changes and develops, that some of its traditions that promote food security will be kept. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tyson, and I'm going to talk to you about innovation. So, my four colleagues and I started making these presentations, and they were all talking about innovative practices in development. And, I don't know, I spent the last couple of years studying development and history, so I was really asking why. Why is this happening? Why are all these NGOs getting creative? You know, where's the innovation coming from? And why are they doing it? The simple answer would be because the old stuff isn't working. So let's try something new. But I want to see if I could go a little deeper, maybe connect to some broader themes in development. Um, I'm going to go into theory here a bit. It's going to get a bit abstract. Bear with me. I'm going to try not to lecture you. So I've seen all this innovation in the NGO sector, and I was wondering, maybe this is part of participatory development. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this, but over the last, let's say, 20 years, a lot of people in the NGO sector have been fighting top-down development when big wigs and ivory towers decide what happens in communities on the ground. So maybe they're trying to make it more grassroots, make it more bottom-up, and all these other phrases we're familiar with. So maybe this innovation and trying things a different way is just another step in participatory development. That's one thought I came up with. Um, having studied history a lot, I tried to draw this into a historical context, I was wondering, Maybe this has something to do with the state leaving development in the 1980s. Since the 1980s, it's been the NGO sector that's been dominating development. This was done for a lot of reasons. People thought they'd be less corrupt, it would be cheaper to run, less administration. Um, there has been a lot of success with the NGO sector, but it hasn't been quite as successful as people had hoped. So when I was in Ghana, where I was for the last six months, I had a very wise boss named Byrne. And in one of my last days, he kind of told me, when it comes to development, the future ain't what it used to be. And that maybe it's not the NGO that's going to be ruling anymore, and the state might be coming back. 
people might have said the NGOs haven't done what they're supposed to, and now we're going to see money going back to the state, and the state is going to be the main agent of development. If this is the case, now more than ever, NGOs need to get creative. They need to start innovating, or else they're going to lose out to the state. So maybe this innovation is coming because the state's coming back. Another theory I've come up with is chasing funding. A lot of NGOs, well, they all depend on donors for their funding, as we know. So I've seen a lot of times in Ghana where NGOs had to manip manipulate their mandates and their projects in an attempt to satisfy a broad number of criteria. So as I personally saw, this often led to them creating very innovative and very unique projects. And while the reason they did it might have been a bit bizarre, oddly enough, it often worked. When they created the most innovative things, they often got results. Um, another explanation might be the proliferation of NGOs. Since the state retreated from development in the 1980s, with neoliberalism, which I think is my favorite word, <laughs> not my favorite theory. Um, <laughs> development joke. <laughs> so, so since the state retreated, we've seen a massive proliferation of NGOs. If you walk down the street in Ghana, it's NGO, 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 which is great. They're doing a lot of important things, but the more NGOs there are, the more competition there is which means these NGOs have got to get creative if they're going to attract attention and if they're going to attack fun attract funding. So once again, maybe this NGO proliferation is reasons why some of these people are getting really creative and coming up with these innovative ideas that my colleagues talked about. But as I said at the beginning, maybe it's just because old things aren't working and they just want to try something new. Anyway, so that's a couple minutes looking into innovation in the development sector. So hopefully it's raised a few questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. On this International Women's Day, five of our associates will now reveal some of what they learned about gender during their placements. Lydia King worked with the Centre for Research, Education and Development in Peru. Stephanie Brown was at the Africa 2000 Network in Ghana. Bethany Johnson was placed with the Centre for Indigenous Knowledge and Organisational Development in Ghana. Sam Mason worked with Sustainable Grenadines Incorporated on Union Island in the Grenadines. And Alexa Minicello's placement was with the Youth Health Organization in Botswana. Good evening. Originally, before embarking on this internship, I thought that gender was dependent on equality. It is, however, much more complex than just being about equality and depends on the social constructs of any given cultural context. My personal experience with this theme took place in the Peruvian Andes where as part of a women's empowerment project I supported the development of an artisan alpaca fiber product for commercialization which was intended to combat the issues of gender roles imposed by machismo. Machismo is a prevalent theme observed in many areas of Latin America. Directly translating from Spanish, machismo means male, or sorry, macho means male, while in contrast, hembra means female. In essence, machismo is a male-dominated society where the importance of the role of the man is valued over the importance of the role of the woman. Machismo is a term that is hard to define, but easier to provide examples for. Machismo allows for the men to be the breadwinners and the women to never question why they cannot too provide for their families. It instills the perception that one must not question their position within a situation of domestic violence. It enforces the concept that a woman's self-worth is defined by that of her husband's. In Castilla, all these trends have been witnessed firsthand. Men who, given the machista construct of their society, are responsible for providing for their families financially. Due to unemployment rates rising in the area, many resorted to drinking. There is a trend of increased alcoholism as a direct result of unemployment, and it was noted that much of the frustration of this cycle was taken out at home in the violent form. By offering the women of Castilla an opportunity to be responsible for their own financial well-being, they have been encouraged to see their, their own value in their communities. 
By providing a chance to be independently responsible for their financial stability, these women have been offered the opportunity to go against the gender roles imposed by their traditionally machista society. I thought that gender was about equality, but I have learned that it is also about fostering independence. I thought that gender was about fostering independence. My Cody internship was, uh, placement was in northern Ghana where I worked on a shea butter project with an association representing 800 women. As you may know, shea butter is a popular moisturizing ingredient found in many of the cosmetics products and lotions that we here in North America, mostly women, are using more and more frequently. The butter is extracted from a nut that grows on trees in the savanna belt, and over the centuries, the shea nut picking and extraction process have largely been activities traditionally undertaken by women. So at first sight, I expected the shea butter project that I was working on to be by women for women. However, I soon came to learn that promoting the economic empowerment of these female shea butter processors is really a collective effort that has positive results that trickle down to both genders alike. Since shea processors are largely illiterate, they rely heavily on the more educated members of their communities, which generally tend to be the men, to help them maintain their records and to link them to potential buyers, both domestically and abroad. So long as the education gap persists in Ghana, men will continue to play a key role in promoting women's rural livelihoods. During my interviews with the women shea butter processors that you see up here, I learned that their earnings raise not only their living standards, but that of their husbands, their children, and their extended families. Profits from shea butter sales allowed women like Fusaina to finance her children's school uniform fees, and for those like Memuna too, to incorporate more nutritious food into her family's diet. Uh, these are examples of how investing in women's financial independence has a multiplier effect that extends to others, boys and men in included. I thought that gender was about fostering independence, and while I think that's very important, I learned from my placement that gender thrives on partnership. I thought that gender thrived on partnerships. And it does. It takes collaboration between men and women and a desire and willingness to work together to ensure equitable access to opportunities and to effectively address issues which relate to a community as a whole. So when I had the opportunity to work with women leaders in Ghana to promote their role in local decision making, I was thrilled to be part of a team that was working with both men, the chiefs, and women, the queen mothers. I spent six months working with the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development on various projects, one of which was their traditional governance system program. Chieftaincy remains a very prevalent political system in Ghana. Within this chieftaincy system, women play an active role as queen mothers, essentially the female version of a chief who focuses on issues related to women, youth, and community development. Queen mothers are members of the National House of Chiefs and well-respected within their communities. That is at least in the south of Ghana. In the north of Ghana, the role of queen mothers has to some extent been lost. CCOD, the organization I was working with, is actively working with traditional leaders to change that. And so in December, I found myself planning a celebratory workshop for queen mothers in the Upper West region, which aimed to share success stories and provide space for addressing challenges to move forward. I had learned that the successes were largely a result of the collaborative effort between chiefs, queen mothers, and community members. Chiefs had recognized the rights of queen mothers as leaders in their community and developed formalized appointment processes and publicly stated that the role of and level of respect for queen mothers would be equal to that of chiefs, though they would be tasked with different responsibilities. So when the day came to actually facilitate the celebratory workshop, I was already applauding. The Queen Mothers were the first to arrive, beautifully dressed in vibrant fabrics with beaded jewelry, and they mingled with each other while we waited for the chiefs. When the chiefs arrived, they sat down and occupied the front seats of the workshop. 
the Queen Mothers filed in afterwards and one by one bowed and greeted each of the, chief, the seated chiefs before taking the seats, uh, remaining seats in the room behind the chiefs. As workshop participants told success stories and relayed strategies they used to overcome challenges, I couldn't help but notice that while they spoke of mutual support and the chieftaincy being one of an equitable participation between chiefs and queen mothers, the physical space seemed to portray the opposite. We were here to celebrate queen mothers. Why were they sitting at the back of the room? Why did they speak only after the chiefs had spoken? We were here to celebrate their role in decision making. Why were they deferring to the chiefs? Was this actually an equal process? An equal partnership? I could have walked away from that workshop feeling discouraged, feeling like the partnership between the chiefs and the queen mothers wasn't actually a partnership. But instead I had the opportunity to interview a few of the queen mothers afterwards. And one woman told me, queen mothers in the north used to be just as respected as those in the south, but we are different from the south. We have our own systems and structures and traditions, and we respect these traditions. It is within these traditions that women used to play a very active role in leadership, and that role hasn't been forgotten. It was remembered by us, and it was remembered by our chiefs, and it has been together that we are helping our communities remember and be proud of that tradition. We are stronger together and stronger because we remember our past and work within it. The final group photo for this workshop shows the Queen Mothers and Chiefs interspersed together. Not the Chiefs sitting in the front row, not the Queen Mother standing behind, but sitting and standing side by side in partnership in line with their tradition. Partnership between men and women is definitely important, but gender requires an element of tradition. It requires a respect for that tradition and involves working within it. I thought gender thrived on partnerships. I learned that gender is also about tradition. Okay, so I thought gender was about tradition. Growing up with a mother and father who were avid feminists, discussing women's rights at the dinner table, and being surrounded by sisters whose achievements are humbling, I thought I had a practical grasp of gender roles and gender dynamics. I thought that when men and women shared household responsibilities, when equal quotas were meant on corporate boards, and when the salary gap was no longer, that is when gender starts to become a non-issue. What I found was the importance of culture today on gender issues. Being placed in the Southern Caribbean, I worked closely and learned from fishermen, water taxi operators, and environmentalists, all of which are, were intent on maintaining their livelihoods in an era of economic depression and global climate change. I was exposed to Rastafarians, tour guides, and the infamous Caribbean time. In such a place where pacifism and love are pronounced, you wouldn't think that violence would ever be occurring behind closed doors. Now, while on my internship, news broke of escalating rates of domestic abuse occurring at remarkably high frequencies in my area. Now, this was reported by the Toronto Star. The news did not seem to make much of an impact on local news agencies. The article exposed the sheer number of refugee claims coming to Canada from women in this region as well as the complete absence of safe houses for endangered women countrywide. Now, I was surrounded by women frequently in positions of leadership, whether it be business owners, government representatives, and community leaders. Yet, what seemed as an indifferent amount of public women of power, as compared to my life in Canada, there was an unspoken, though widespread issue surrounding domestic abuse. So I had a difficulty making the connection between women in leadership roles and their safety at home. Now, I'm unable to make any kind of generalization that domestic abuse was more frequent in my area than it is here. Uh, but there's, as there's been no research done locally in the Southern Caribbean. Uh, but I did become aware of domestic abuse taking place in families in which I had a growing relationship. Now, in respect to that, Along with this being uh, the International Day of Women, I cannot help but take this opportunity to talk about gender roles. 
So in my opinion, one of the more indica indica indicative, indicative, <laughs> indicative <laughs> difference in the way men, men and women are portrayed in the Southern Caribbean is through the misogyny in the lyrics of the local uh, calypso music. Now, this type of language is incomparable to the language we see in mainstream Canadian music. Uh, some of the lyrics are, are so crude, in fact, that you wonder, is it, is it the culture that is then breeding into the civilian behavior, or does that culture come from uh, the civilian behavior itself? Now, those are questions I was unable to answer uh, on my internship. But though since returning to Canada, I've done some further research, and it seems as though the epicenters of the Southern Caribbean, such as Trinidad, uh, there is a movement and a rise of female artists now sharing their own message as pop stars. Often now their lyrics are condemning domestic abuse and taking hold of the leadership roles as cultural role models. Uh, as with many movements, I'm sure this ideology will, will drift from the capitals and, and enter the, the more rural region of the Southern Caribbean islands. I thought gender could be defined by tradition. I have now learned that gender cannot be fully did out, laid out without considering culture. I thought gender was defined by culture. And in some ways, it has been in Botswana. But when examining the HIV and AIDS ep epidemic, one requires an exploration which is much more in depth. Cultural values surrounding the notions of masculinity, monogamy, and personal responsibility, some ideas that have all been, already been addressed um, earlier in this theme, do continue to influence the transmission of the HIV virus, which has come to affect one in four adults in Botswana. However, there's been a growing recognition that the biological, social, and cultural differences of both men and women should and do influence the purpose, mandate, and model of sexual reproductive health services. The Botswana Family Welfare Association and Youth Health Organization are two grassroots groups that I had the pleasure of working with in Botswana. Both of these organizations have committed themselves to incorporating an equitable, equitable mandate, ensuring that programs and services are attuned to the needs of both men and women. Two specific interventions that I can think of that have done this well in Botswana uh, is the Safe Male Circumcision Project and the increased availability of female condoms. The increased popularity and resulting availability of female condoms acts as one way in which women are beginning to assert more ownership over their reproductive health and rights. For years, women have been vulnerable to HIV infections in Botswana due in part to their limited social, economic, and cultural influence. Women more generally have lacked access to formal education and have had fewer entitlements than men, impacting their ability to assert control over their reproductive rights. However, the female condom provides women with this direct control. This project has had far-reaching benefits amongst female sex workers in Botswana who are now in control over their own protection when engaging with men. Men are also being targeted to have an increased ownership over their reproductive health. The Safe Male Circumcision Project, which encourages circumcision amongst men of any age, as it's shown to have a um, will potentially reduce a man's risk of acquiring an HIV by 60%, uh, I believe parallels the Movember movement that we have in Canada today. Uh, both movements uh, attempt to instill personal ownership uh, within men to go to the doctor and to gain a better understanding of their sexual health. One inspiration that I've had in Botswana uh, in terms of the Safe Male Circumcision Project has been the nurse at the Botswana Family Welfare Association. Pampiri, or Paper as we phoned him, uh, is regularly, or called him, is regularly <laughs> tested for HIV and actually was circumcised uh, when we were in the country. So he came into work the next day and was like, I was circumcised yesterday. <laughs> and we were like, whoa, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and when we asked why, why he had done that, he'd explained to me that uh, he felt that he needed to be able to speak from personal experiences when he went uh, and did outreach with young men and women in Botswana. So it was really important that 
Uh, he could show other youth that people just like them are taking ownership over their health and, and making choices that can protect them and their partners in the long run. Uh, papers really show me the value of not just talking about an issue, but really being about it too. Um, I do believe, however, that these programs could not have been successful without a full commitment to a gender equitable approach. Increased control over women's reproductive health cannot exist and have lasting success without an explicit acceptance of female condoms within the society. Just as the Safe Male Circumcision Project won't uh, garner full protection from men unless there are uh, women who are supporting their brothers, fathers, or partners to go and be tested for HIV and then circumcised. These collaborations, I believe, move beyond the cultural dynamics of any society and hope to foster a more equitable partnership between men and women. I thought gender was defined by culture, but through my experiences in Botswana, working with young people in sexual reproductive health services and outreach, I've come to learn that gender demands equity. The final group will examine how communities can and do drive real change. Stephanie Dewar was placed with the Caribbean Farmers Network in St Vincent. Kieran Guilfoy was at Oxfam Canada in Ethiopia. Pauline Beaupre and Catherine Cormier worked with Sustainable Grenadines Incorporated on Union Island. And Nora Eggleston worked at the Youth Association for Human Rights Promotion and Development in Rwanda. So it was during orientation here at the Cody that I was first introduced to the Anaganish Movement, which is a strategy for community development that responded to the struggles of disadvantaged groups in the Maritimes by addressing the immediate needs of the local people. While this philosophy sounded ideal in theory, it wasn't until I actually witnessed this cooperative approach in action that I fully understood how effective and motivating it can be for community members to become masters of their own destiny, in the words of Cody himself. I first met the Vermont Labor Cluster back on a field visit in, November, in October. Sorry. Their leader and lone female member, Ms. Prescott, who's right up there, was a volunteer field officer with ECTAD, which was a partner NGO for the Caribbean Farmers Network. Like Cody had done in Anaganish, Ms. Prescott led this group of seven farmers to cooperatively resolve the challenges hindering their development within the agriculture sector. Hit hard by the devastating loss of their banana crops, an aging population of poorly educated farmers, and the unpredictable effects of climate change, the country's primary industry has been struggling to recover in the midst of a depressed national economy. More specifically, these farmers in the rural Vincentian community of Vermont were struggling with labor-related issues of high cost and um, limited workforce. To collectively address their economic needs, these seven individuals pooled their human resources to create a labor-sharing cluster. Basically, each week, the group rotates through their respective lands to help one another with the entire farming process. And every day, Ms. Prescott prepares a hearty home-cooked lunch at, to keep them going. It wasn't until a few months later, though, that I experienced the most inspirational moment of my placement. I was sent back to Vermont to report on the Labor Cluster's first year anniversary. To commemorate this milestone, which many local critics, critics doubted would ever come about, this group of farmers had returned to their childhood primary school where they were starting a backyard, or backyard garden project. It was a rainy gray Tuesday, yet by the time I reached the school late that morning, the farmers had already been hard at work for hours, and they had already produced a gorgeous plot of land to become their garden. Their enthusiasm and energy was contagious, especially for Mr. Francis's fourth grade students that were excitedly and eagerly admiring their future garden. Not only were these farmers encouraging youth involvement in agriculture, which is a major obstacle to sustainability in the sector, but they were also promoting healthy eating habits to a generation that's facing a dramatic rise in nutrition-related diseases. And it won't be long before these vibrant youth are harvesting their very own organic vegetables to contribute to their own school cafeteria's feeding program. It was obvious that I wasn't the only bystander inspired 
by these op this optimistic group of self-motivated community members. Their example of success continues to spread across the Caribbean Farmers Network, um, their extensive regional network of farmers organizations. And as a result, more and more farmers are adopting this group action that seeks to, provi to provide a full and abundant life for the lo their local communities. And if the response from Mr. Francis's first gra or fourth grade class was any indication, this small group of farmers from Vermont is inspiring a new generation of agriculture professionals and the future farming leaders of the Caribbean. Good evening. Growing up in Anaganish, I, unlike Steph, was well versed in the history of the Cody and the Anaganish movement prior to the orientation phase of this internship. The strong sense of community found in this town and in my upbringing integrated organically with my emerging understanding of international development. However, this organic grassroots perspective was challenged from the outset of my internship in Ethiopia. Throughout the Ethiopian countryside, decades of drought and international humanitarian intervention has had a noticeable psychological impact on low-income rural farming communities. Call it a dependency complex or top-down development syndrome, it has grown into conventional understanding in which outsiders arrive in villages and address needs. Prior to embarking on my internship, news feeds on the drought in the Horn of Africa resulted in numerous questions about whether I was going over to help. Though irrational, I panicked at the prospect of running around with jerry cans and relief packages as I am highly susceptible to calluses, back pain, sunburns, and clammy hands when I exercise. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was going to survive the six months. Thankfully, two feet in a heartbeat wasn't all that Oxfam required of me. I was forced to use my head as well. And learning became more important than helping. Placed within the Asset-Based Community Development Program, ABCD, of Oxfam Canada, I was granted a unique opportunity to witness firsthand dynamic processes occurring in all corners of Ethiopia, which were challenging conventional concepts of development and who was qualified to practice them. ABCD, as a development initiative, seeks to reverse the top-down needs-based culture of development and instead replace it with an asset-based, bottom-up approach. Communities are gathered and are provided and encouraged to shift perceptions of their surroundings through different exercises like discussion, asset mapping, and understanding linkages in their local economies. From there, communities pool and mobilize previously invisible assets to dictate their own future. The impacts have been dramatic and have reached beyond economic and livelihood benefits to broader social contexts. In Woyan, which is in the, the picture here, a small rural farming village which I visited in northwest e Ethiopia, ABC community members have gotten together to partake in beekeeping activities weaving land regeneration projects on their own to dramatically increase household incomes. Prior to returning and following a community discussion, it was recently decided that a certain percentage of each member's increased income would be used to sponsor the education of local HIV orphans who have historically been socially and economically marginalized. Thus, the community not only raised income levels through cooperative action, but also challenged and changed local traditions around HIV and social integration. Witnessing the independence of sex of Wyom and communities like it reaffirmed and reinvigorated my view on the community's role in development initiatives. It seems a bit peculiar to travel halfway around the world to rediscover a practice undertaken decades ago in my hometown. However, the experience intimately portrayed that community, its power, and its role in dynamic processes is not unique to any particular locality. So I spent my six months uh, working for Sesgren, which is a local NGO in the Grenadines that's dedicated to um, marine conservation and enhancing the capacity of civil society to be involved in environmental issues. Uh, living on Union Island, I was exposed to various forms of community. A sense of community based on common interests, such as people playing in the local soccer, um, soccer team, 
community uh, based on geogra uh, geography, so uh, neighbors and close friends, and also a sense of community based on even just time, so eating lunch with the same people every day. And it became very apparent that the strength of community on the island and the positive impacts that it had. A particular project I was working on that involved a strong community present was creating a marine multi-use zoning plan that spanned the length of the Grenadine Islands. Essentially, it was applying principles of land use planning to the ocean, whereby certain areas were giving designated uses for activities such as fishing, conservation, shipping routes, and as Kyle already mentioned, CMOS farming. Uh, this project focused on collecting the input and opinions of those whose livelihoods were di directly dependent on the ocean and its resources. It recognized the importance of these stakeholders and deemed participation from the communities fundamental for success. So when I talk about the project, who am I really talking about? Although the project is facilitated by the University of the West Indies in Barbados, it was sparked by the communities of resource users throughout the region. In absence of a concrete management plan, it was members of the community, those who's closely reliant on the resources, who were determined it would be them to try to make a plan to ensure sustainable uh, use of the marine resources. So while I was at one of these stakeholder meetings, which included um, people in the yachting community, fishermen, uh, shippers as well, there was a particular fisherman who voiced anger and discontentment towards the project, specifically accusing the facilitator you don't care about the fishermen or what their needs are. Look what happened in the Tobago Keys. They made that a protected area for conservation and tourism, and now we can't fish there anymore. The Tobago Keys are, in fact, a marine protected area that was established by the government in 1998. It was not the facilitator that responded to this accusation, however. Instead, it was the local fellow fishermen. Yeah, it is a marine park, and we can't fish there anymore. But the government came around and asked us, asked us what we thought, and we didn't say anything. We didn't go to the meetings that they were holding. We didn't tell them that we needed to go there to get our bait fish. So in reality, it's our own fault. And it's why we're here now, to make sure our voices are heard. I think this example really illustrated to me the value of community input and the power of participation, the power to directly affect the decisions and outcomes. Although this example shows how a lack of participation can create situations that work against those affected, where the fishermen livelihoods were jeopardized because they did not provide input, it goes beyond that. It demonstrates the lessons learned by this specific community that their involvement is integral for the future use and sustainability of their marine environment. Thank you. So being in the Grenadines for the past six months has been a real eye-opener in terms of learning about the difficulty many islands in developing countries face in terms of sustainable and effective waste management systems. There's one waste management system on Union Island, but unfortunately very little waste reaches this destination. Waste is consistently thrown on the grounds despite the many trash bins scattered over the island, and not to mention there's no recycling or composting programs set up. Things like this just pose too large of a cost for such a small community. As Pauline mentioned, Susquehanna is an environmental NGO that works to conserve the marine and coastal environment of the Grenadine Islands, along with promoting sustainable livelihoods for the people that use these resources. Susquehanna works with various groups within its community. But the area of community I felt most privileged to work with was the youth, as their excitement and enthusiasm was infectious as they truly were excited to get involved and take responsibility for their own community's development. One of the many things that Susquehanna does to address the issue of waste management is to involve the youth by holding an international coastal cleanup once a year. I was privileged to be able to assist in the seventh annual international coastal cleanup on Union Island. And actually it was held in conjunction with another NGO called the Environmental Attackers in which the head of that NGO is a former Cody diploma participant, Katrina Collins. So I was set up with a group of about 10 fifth grade girls, and we walked through the streets of Ashton, one of the two small communities on Union Island, picking up garbage. The girls were extremely eager about what they were doing, um, picking up garbage and recording what we had found. They were so inquisitive and excited about what we were doing that they even asked me if we could go and do it again the next Saturday. <laughs> 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 
Anyways, so the streets and the, <laughs> the streets, the mangroves, and the coastline are home to an absolutely insane amount of garbage. Um, but my troop of 10-year-old girls managed to fill two large garbage bags to the brim uh, with ease in within an hour. And overall, the International Coastal Cleanup on Union Island collected more than 20 large garbage bags uh, full of garbage in a relatively short period of time with a limited number of hands and tiny hands at that. So it's not perhaps the garbage that we took off the shores of Union that is the main accomplishment of the International Coastal Cleanup, but it's the lessons that the children took away from this cleanup. And it was truly inspiring to see how excited these young girls were about taking responsibility over their own community and making a positive change within their community. So we've all heard the cliche that the youth are the future, but in the case of making important changes towards environmental sustainability in the Grenadine Islands, it's true. Um, young people are generally more accepting of new ideas, and as such, um, educating youth on the importance of environmental sustainability, even something as simple as to not litter, uh, results in the raising of a generation who care about this and will enact this change in their lifetime. Thank you. Before, we were known for genocide and violence, but now we are recognized for good work and in initiating homegrown solutions. Rwanda's secret is our culture of finding solutions within ourselves. This is a quote from Paul Kagame, current president of Rwanda. And yes, while we do need to look at modern day Rwanda and particularly its leadership critically, for me, this quote from the president sums up my experience with the country. As both Farah and Matthew have alluded to earlier in their presentations, what I took away the most from Rwanda was the overwhelming sense of community and national solidarity in the country today. Rwandans have a great sense of pride and respect for themselves and for others. And together, as one community, they are working to develop their country, and they are doing this at the backdrop of real unity and reconciliation. And the progress and promise of this country is tangible, and this is evidenced in the latest Rwanda National Survey on Household Living Conditions, which found that since 2006, Rwanda has reduced its poverty rate from 52% to, to 45%, and this translates into approximately one million people being lifted out of extreme poverty in six years. And at the forefront of this, and as key players, has been and will continue to be the youth of the country, the largest demographic group of the country. And while the government supports and recognizes the power of youth, they gain most of their strength from the growing civil society movement. For instance, Aj Proto Youth Association for Human Rights Promotion and Development, where I worked, began as a simple student association at the National University, working to promote our harmonious co uh, coexistence of youth following the genocide. Today, they are working to promote youth participation for social justice and decent living conditions for all as a national level registered NGO with 22 staff members, a member base of over 280 youth, and a network of over 500 young people. And it was a great time working with Aj Proto. And I think what made it so meaningful and powerful was that I was able to come in and feel and see this sense of community and power from within youth, and then be able to become a part of it myself. And this was both at, uh, in the workplace, working with my colleagues on national issues, but also simply participating in everyday community life and specific community initiatives, such as this walk through Kigali to promote awareness on gender-based violence. And what made this possible was that for myself and those that I was interacting with in Rwanda, although we recognized that we had different cultures, contexts, and histories, that in essence, we all came from one larger community and that we had shared challenges and issues, but also hopes and dreams. And so now, when I think of the term international community, I don't think of the classic textbook or classroom definition of only the big international development players, such as the UN, the World Bank, donor governments, but I think of us. I think of you and I, I think of our communities, I think of Cody and its partners around the world. And what really brought this home for me was that during my internship, I got to visit a recent Cody Diploma Program graduate Nora Makubuya, um, and when I visited her, it was like I was visiting any old neighbor from back home. I was able to meet her family, feel welcomed into her home, and as well as with her neighbors, and hear her stories of working as a development practitioner in her community. And so, what I would like to say is that as I leave the Cody, I feel that I belong to an integral member of the international community. And to conclude, 
As we began our program here last August in Inigenish with Cody, and while we are formally closing it tonight here again with you, like the Inigenish movement that started in this community and is now building partnerships around the world, it doesn't end here. Not for us, not for the Cody, not for you, not tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.